as you know, I find the history of the Etruscans very interesting because there are many aspects of their culture that remain a bit of a mystery. There was also a lot of cross-cultural exchange between the Etruscans, the Romans, the Greeks and the Egyptians. So isolating Etruscan ideas and practices from the cultural milieu of their day is quite a task. In this video, I discuss the discovery of a linen book written in the mostly undeciphered written language of the Etruscans that was found wrapped around an Egyptian mummy from Alexandria. This discovery was both groundbreaking and revelatory because up until it was made, no Etruscan linen books had been found, although they were known to have existed, and any extant inscriptions in that language were much shorter, providing limited information for paleographers. In the 19th century, the Museum of Zagreb came into the possession of an Egyptian mummy from the Ptolemaic period, whose wrappings had been removed but kept alongside it. The mummy had originally been acquired in Alexandria by a Croatian man in the 1840s. The wrappings consisted of linen strips covered in text that Egyptologists confirmed were not hieroglyphics or in Coptic as might be expected. Eventually, the wrappings were sent to Vienna for analysis by another Egyptologist, Jacob Kral, who also agreed the text was not in an Egyptian language, but did come to the realisation that it was written in Etruscan. At the time, it was known from references in classical texts and depictions on funerary statues that Etruscan linen books had existed, but none had been discovered. Also, this was the longest text in that forgotten language to have been found. The text came to be known as the Linen Book of Zagreb, or Liber Lintius Zagrabiensis in Latin. As well as the Etruscan text, the mummy, which belonged to a woman who had died between the ages of 30 and 40, was also wrapped in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This Egyptian text mentions a woman called Nessie Knons, meaning the mistress of the house, which was probably referring to the mummified individual. It seems she was married to a tailor, so did not belong to the elite classes. Other grave goods included a beaded necklace, a headdress of flowers and gold, and a mummified cat skull. The mummy was dated to between the 4th and 1st centuries BCE. Originally, the Linen Book of Zagreb would have been a sheet more than 3 metres long, containing 12 columns of text, and was meant to be read from right to left. Each column represented a page. There are 230 lines of text made up of roughly 1,330 words. It's thought these represent around 60% of what would have been on the entire manuscript. It was mostly written in black ink made from burnt ivory, with red lines and glyphs made using pigment derived from cinnabar. The original manuscript would have been folded rather like an accordion rather than rolled into a scroll or put together as individual leaves in a codex. Further work with infrared photography in the 20th century revealed text that couldn't be seen by the naked eye. As far as experts can understand it, since a large part of the Etruscan written language has never been translated, the book discussed the ritual calendar and the gods. Here is an example of some of the text and its translation found on the linen strips. On August the 13th, conduct the consecration according to the rite. Keep the doors open then for the consecration. On September the 24th, sacrificial victims for Nethans, Neptune, are to be presented. The text mentions several Etruscan gods, such as the water deity Nethans, probably the equivalent to the Roman god Neptune, and the sun god Usil, probably the equivalent to the Greek god Helios. It appears to be a guide to the year, explaining when certain rituals, such as the pouring of libations and the sacrifice of animals, should be carried out as dedications to different deities. Interestingly, the locations of the rituals mentioned appear to be outside of Etruscan cities, possibly near rivers, on hilltops and in cemeteries. As soon as I hear hilltops, I think of all those Cyclopean walls surrounding them, but this isn't a video about those. I've made several videos on Cyclopean walls, if you're interested though, because I'm researching them in depth. 
There are several different liquids referred to for libations, including wine and oil, but also others that cannot be identified. It's not clear who's carrying out the rituals. There are various titles mentioned which are thought to refer to different types of priests, but experts aren't sure about this or what the roles of each person would have been exactly. A partial translation of column 3, strip C is the sacrifice, be it funerary or be it chthonic, is to be put on the decorated litter. Then say, the sacrifice and the dog are presented as the offering, and collect the goblets, and then present the puppy and the dog. The libation that was poured in the sacred area of Sousny Percy should be poured just as it was poured on the decorated litter. Make the libation three times. Make the offering as it has been established. Carry it out as is appropriate and observe the appropriate rituals. The linen itself has been dated to 390 BCE, but a paleographic analysis of the manuscript puts the text at 250 BCE. Based on the gods mentioned, it's thought the book was produced in the southeast of Tuscany, where four important Etruscan settlements were located. Aritim, modern-day Arezzo, Perusia, modern-day Perugia, Clevzin, modern-day Cusi, and Curtin, modern-day Cortona. These four cities formed part of the Dodecapolis, which comprised the 12 most important Etruscan settlements. No one is quite sure how an Egyptian mummy came to be wrapped in an Etruscan text. It's quite possible that those involved in the mummification process simply picked up whatever was available to them. And with Alexandria being a trading port and cultural hub, an Etruscan book probably wasn't such an unusual commodity. However, since some Etruscan statuary shows linen books in tombs, similar to how the Book of the Dead was incorporated into ancient Egyptian burials, then it's possible that the linen was used on purpose. This may indicate that the woman had mixed Etruscan and Egyptian ancestry. The second longest Etruscan text is known as the Tabula Capuana and also appears to be a ritual calendar. So both the Linen Book of Zagreb and the Tabula Capuana are extremely important to scholars, both those who are working to understand the Etruscan language and those who are looking for more insights into the rituals and practices of that culture. Another important resource is the Chippus Perusinus, which was discovered on the San Marco Hill near Perugia. This appears to be a legal contract between two Etruscan families, the Valthina from Perugia and the Afuna from Cusi, about the use of some property. Experts think that the Etruscans spoke a non-Indo-European language, one that they wrote down using the Greek alphabet after extensive trade acquainted them with it. Their origins are supposedly indigenous to the Italian peninsula, emerging from the previous Iron Age culture known as the Villanovans. So it could be that the language survived from very ancient times. Some scholars think there may be a connection to the Raetic language, which was spoken in the Alps during Roman times. And let us not forget the stele I've mentioned before that was found on the Greek island of Lemnos, with an inscription thought to be in the Lemnian language that also may have had a relationship with Etruscan. Sometimes Etruscan, Lemnian and Raetic are grouped into a language family called Tersenian. I find these undeciphered scripts deeply fascinating. There are several in the ancient world, such as Cretan hieroglyphics and Linear A, used by the Minoans. And I'm also intrigued by the modern-day language isolates, such as Basque, which could also have very ancient origins. Linguistics and paleography are two complex subjects that require an in-depth understanding if we want to speculate, but I do think they hold keys to unlocking the past. I also think myths and legends have their place. The cultures of the Italian peninsula are inextricably linked to the Aegean through their origin stories. And although archaeological evidence for this is lacking, there may be some truth to it. But it's also important to remember that, for example, in the ancient Greek world, foundation myths were often told for political reasons to bolster one particular region's status. Scholars know that this took place. They have a lot of evidence for it. So as an independent researcher who is taking an interdisciplinary approach, I have to be cautious when attempting to make correlations. And I have to make sure that I'm fully aware of the latest work in these areas. Very often I see people making speculations that can be debunked in five minutes because they haven't done the groundwork. But that said, I also don't want to shy away from throwing some ideas out there. However, I'll never say that they are absolute fact or that you can't change my mind on any of it because that's just silly. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button. Thank you to my patrons and channel members for all of your support. And I'll catch up with you next time. Thank you.